Good morning. Welcome to our virtual service today at Calvary Baptist Church. I wish I could say to you I was glad to see everyone here today, but clearly I cannot see anyone. But, you know, if you are here listening to this, if you're listening to this, we're, here, we're at least worshiping in spirit and truth together, and this is true. Uh, today, just for a little heads up, we're going to be in, we're gonna be in uh, Matthew 6 and, and verses 25 to 34. And when we get into these verses, Jesus is going to be telling us, don't worry about life, not to worry. It is very important for us to keep this in mind in our lives. Uh, but uh, we sure can't find things to worry about, can't we? In life, we really do. And with the advent of the coronavirus coming in, we now have a war chest of things to worry about. It's amazing, right? Am I going to get it? Is someone in my family going to get it? Am I going to have a job? Uh, it, is there going to be food? And the most interesting one that's come up with all this, will I be able to get toilet paper? And I find that an amazing thing for people to be worrying about, but it's something that people clearly are worrying about. In fact, even just giving this message with the instructions we have to not have the, uh, the virus spread, we're not supposed to touch our faces. So I'm wondering if someone's going to be out there counting the number of times I touch my face while I speak. And should I worry about that, the number of touches? I, I hope not, because it might distract me. But I'd like to take a word, I'd like to take a moment here just to pray, pray for this message, and pray for people around the world at this time. Lord, we do thank you that we can come here and, and, and well, not all come here, but we can hear your word preached, Lord. Uh, you've provided a way for us to have your word spread throughout the world. You're in control of everything. As we come to this message, Lord, uh, please help us, Lord, to not worry, but to put all of our trust and cares in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 looking at verses 25 to 34, and there's three points to this message. Don't worry about your life. That's what Jesus told us in this message. And we have value. Our life is valuable. And the last point will be that Jesus is a shelter in a time of storm. And uh, that's something we really need to take to heart. But Jesus made a declarative statement in Matthew 25, 625, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not your life more than food and your body more than clothing? That's such an important verse for us to think about. And the word, don't worry about it, don't comes up, and it, seems, it could seem maybe a little bit negative, right? You know, don't do this, don't do that. Well, if you go to the Ten Commandments, we have many do not statements in the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, don't steal, uh, don't covet. These are good things. These direct our paths. So don't worry is something to direct our paths. Don't worry about life. Now, what is worry? It's interesting. I was thinking about what worry. Worry is a terrorist that is taking our faith hostage. It really has. Jesus came. He came to the world, and he came as a ransom for us. He paid the penalty for our sin. What Jesus did, he reconciled mankind to God because we could not reconcile ourselves. So God sent his son to reconcile mankind to him. He paid a ransom for us when he's doing this. Now, if you know who Jesus is, I don't mean that you're just acquainted with him, but you know who he is. You have a lot of freedom in your life. You're completely free. But in Mark 10, 45, this is what Jesus did when he paid that ransom. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, to, to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. That's the ransom that Jesus paid. And when we fall into worry, do you see how that might actually devalue the ransom that Jesus paid for us? Because where is our trust? We're trusting in Jesus, yet we're worrying. We need to think this through sometimes. What's been lost in this world? The lack of a concern about having a relationship with God. Is God just your creator? God created the rocks, too. Are you just a rock? Is he your father? Can you go to your heavenly father? Think about a child. What does a child do when they're distressed? They crawl up into the arms of their parents, don't they? And the distress is alleviated. Now, it would appear that worry has or may hold people hostage that Jesus has paid a ransom for already for their freedom. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a terrorist, a terrorist tactic, taking people ransom. Jesus gave his life so we would not be confounded by worry. Our text is clear not to worry about life or the elements that sustain it. And that's why I get this term, emotional indigestion. I was trying to, trying to get worry down and trying to understand it. Once worry is engaged in us, all the events and the images and everything that's coming into our life is filtered through worry. Worry becomes the highest function in our brain. Everything that's coming in is going through the worry filter. Logic and reason, they become slaves to worry in our decision-making processes. Can you really be happy in a worried state? Can you truly forgive when you're worried? Can you joyfully encourage others while you're worried? You know, this list goes on. It can go on. But the fruits of the Spirit are completely compromised when we're in a state of worry. How can love, joy, peace coexist with worry? I suggest to you that they cannot. Worry is a black hole. It sucks in everything in its path, consuming all the energy that's available to an individual. It really does. So there's nothing left. We go to sleep at night if you're worried, and sleep really doesn't restore a person's energy. What does sleep do? It simply recharges a person so the next day they can worry some more because the worry isn't gone. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, don't do this. <laughs> it's an amazing, he said, don't do this. If I'm a child of God and I understand that he's paid a ransom for me, I'm to be a light to the world. If I fall into a state of worry, I just put a lampshade on my light with a great big ugly parrot on it. I can't be a light to the world if I'm in a state of worry. And how does worry even happen? Worry happens when legitimate concerns are left unchecked and they morph into worry. That's what happens. Worry takes the worst case scenario of our thoughts and the images and replays them in our minds over and over. It becomes uncontrollable. Legitimate concerns may require, legitimate concerns really may require all of our cognitive energy, and that's a good thing. If you have a legitimate concern in your life, you might need to really just bear down and focus on it and deal with the issue. We might need to focus, but when you, ed, when you embed worry into your thought processes, that cognitive energy is completely short-circuited. All that energy you're putting in there is now, it's dispersed. It will not be focused where you need to go. That's what happens when we get into worry. That happens to worry. But Jesus says, don't worry about your life. So what is life? You know, life, it's interesting. And I realize this might be a very long message if I discuss what's the meaning of life. But uh, that's not what we're going to be doing today. But when we get to life, we get to it. Life, uh, when we look at it from a science perspective, biology is the study of life, right? Biology is study of life. Bio means life, and ology is the study of life. I think a really good definition for biology is the study of living things in their interactions with their environment. I think that's a really good definition of biology. You know, biology and science, I've been doing science my entire professional career. I've been doing biology, chemistry, physics, forensic science. I've got to tell you, I love science. Science is so cool. You know, science allows you to see the complexities of life. It lets you get out to a molecular level and an atomic level. And when you do this, you see the real complexity that makes up our universe. One thing becomes clearly evident. There needed to be a designer and a cre creator for this all to exist. When we start getting down to the nitty gritty of it all, it's amazing. That's why I love science. And science does a great job of observing processes, including the beginning of life. It really does. Think about us as people for a moment, OK? We're human. We're made up of 23 pairs of chromosomes, OK? That's how we're made up. One set we get from our father, one set we get from our mother. And the chromosomes come together, we get 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes. All the genetic material that makes us up came from that original mating between those two sets of chromosomes, didn't it? All the genetic material, all these amino acids in different sequences 
make us up, to make each and every one of us as individuals. The color of your hair, everything about your height, everything about you has been created in that. But how did life actually get sparked out of that chromosomal pairing to become a full-bodied human being? It's not known. We can study the process in depth. We really can. We can look at that. We can look at cell division. We look at meiosis, mitosis, cell reproduction. It's incredible the detail we can go through. But how did life get in there? People might not want to hear this in the scientific community, which I'm part of, but we don't have a clue. But in our text, Jesus isn't the least bit concerned about how the spark of life got into us. What was Jesus concerned? He's concerned about the essence of life and how we live our lives, because he did not want us to be worried. Why don't we want to be worried? Because we want to stay out of the, the pit of worry, because pit really is a worry. It really is. I want you to think about pit for a moment. In the Old Testament, in fact, this morning, I was reading through Job, I think it was in chapter 9, and Job's talking about falling to a pit. The word pit is used like 80 or 90 times in the Bible, and it always has a negative connotation, I believe, because you do not want to fall into a pit. Think about Joseph for a while. Do you remember Joseph? Old Testament. Joseph was daddy's favorite, wasn't he? Jacob loved Joseph more than anyone else. Joseph got the multicolored coat. Joseph was hated by his brothers. <laughs> Daddy shouldn't have shown that kind of favoritism. Didn't work out well. So what did his brothers do? They got upset with Joseph. So upset they were going to kill him. And they planned to kill him. They got him off to the side out into the wilderness. And they were going to kill him. And in, and in, and in Genesis uh, 37, 22, they're about to kill him. But one of the brothers, Reuben, says, hold off, guys. We can't kill him. We can't have his death on our hands. I got a better idea. Let's throw him in a pit. That's a strange sort of rationalization, is it? I guess if you're not going to have the blood on your hands, you won't see him die in a pit. But a pit is not something you want to fall into. It really isn't. Now, the providence of God got Joseph out of that pit. It really did. And Joseph went on to do great things for, for God. But pits really are the pits. And we don't want to fall into one because you'll die in there because a pit is death. A pit is something that's out in the wilderness. Think of Joseph for a moment, though. Someone else put Joseph into that pit. But the jailer of worry is self. When you're in a state of worry, you've put yourself into a pit. That's what happened. You know that expression, being your own worst enemy? It's so true. How can we escape from a jail that we've put ourselves in? And that's what worry does. Because worry will really wear you out. And we all have our pressure points, don't we? You know, think of it. At some point where you start to worry, I have a question for you. Does worry ever change anything? Has worry ever changed a single thing for you? The answer is no. There's always going to be an outcome. It really is. Because worry is futile. The futility of worry is so great. In Matthew 6, 27, it says to us, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to a stature here? to a stature. Now, stature here really means life. So if you look at the, the ESV version of the Bible, it says, and which of you, by being anxious, can add one single hour to, his, to the lifespan of his life? That's the point of it. And this sums it up so well, doesn't it? Worry is futile. We can't add a minute to our lives. On the contrary, worry has a lot of negative impacts on our life, physical negative impacts. What are they? Because worry is always negative. It won't add to your life. Physical things that happen when you worry, or the funny thing about it is, first thing is kind of strange, your fingernails are gone, right? What do people do that are worrying? They chew up their fingernails like ears of corn. Just watch it. They get worried. Those cuticles, everything. People are eating their fingers. It looks strange. What else is going to worry do? How about our weight? Some people gain weight. Some people will lose weight. This rogue emotion of worry manifests itself on people two different ways. They're both unhealthy, aren't they? We don't want either of those things. We don't want to gain weight, and we don't want to lose weight like this. It's so unhealthy. What about those rings under people's eyes? Well, you're in a state of worry. What's that doing? You're not sleeping. You're worn out. 
rings of the eyes, and all of the body is just, when you're worried, your entire body is, is, is stressed. All, the, all of your body, your endocrine system, all the parts of your body are stressed. They're not working properly. So rings of the eyes start to repair. You get hair loss. I must have been really worried. I lost all my hair, right? People lose their hair when they're worried. They get ulcers. Think of this. It's in your stomach. You're worried about things. And you're getting, effectively, a wound in your stomach. And your stomach is full of acid. It's very painful. And this list goes on. If you were to speak to a clinical psychologist, they'd give you a list of these things that would be tremendous. But here we are in the United States. And haven't we been enjoying great prosperity for the past number of years? It's been great, hasn't it? The stock market's booming. Everyone's lowest jobs, uh, job rate, you know, people just, everyone can get a job. You want a job, you can have a job. People are making money. All things going great. Enter a microscopic virus, corona. You know, a virus may be the simplest life form on the planet. It's described as basically a protein coat with some DNA material inside it. And it's really tiny. It's small. You just can't see it under a microscope. You need to have a, 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 the proper, proper uh, observation platform to see a virus. What do viruses do? Well, someone sneezes, as we all know now, and you inhale some droplets in the air. And the virus goes into you. This viron goes into you. And that virus, being a little guy, attaches right to cells in your body. And what does the virus do? That virus injects its genetic material into a cell in your body. Because viruses are so simple, they can't reproduce on their own. They don't have any of the normal organelles of a cell that we would understand. So it goes in, but that genetic material is pretty smart. It takes over the operation of the cells in your body. And it starts making more viruses using the cells of your body. And then those cells just keep on multiplying, multiplying. Before you know it, you're very sick. This is what a virus does. It's a parasite, and it's living off you. And it can spread. It seems aimless to us, doesn't it? Why does God even allow this? But he does. It's living. It's alive. With the virus, there's a threat to people's lives. Worry enters into the scene. And it's not hard to see why people start worrying with all the input we're getting. I want you to think for a moment. <laughs> think of this. Have you ever watched any of these movies out there where they have prisoners or a war movie or something, and they're interrogating them, and they have them tied down to a chair with a bright light on them, right? And they're, you know, they deprive them of sleep, and they're just interrogating them. They're trying to get information out of the prisoner, and they're just really doing these mental games with them. Isn't that sort of what's been happening to us? Think about this. We have bright lights on us. Turn on your TV. Corona. Look on your phone, corona. Look on your computer, corona. We're in information overload, ladies and gentlemen. This is coming at us continuously. This information is changing on an hourly basis. We are overloaded. It is no wonder that people are getting worried. It's just too much. It's too much for us to handle. It will really wear a person down, this barrage of information. And then what happens is, we can now have body counts of people dying. I mean, that'll make you stop and think. How many died in that country? How many died today? How many died yesterday? I'm going to give a little history lesson. When I was a, a young lad in 1967, at about the age of 10, there was something called the Vietnam War went on. Vietnam War was a very unpopular war. But what happened every morning is on the news, they had body counts. So many North Vietnamese died. So many American died. And that's how they decided who won or lost a battle, by the number of bodies. Do you know our military has never, ever used that technique again to determine victory or defeat because it was so unsuccessful? What do we have now in society? Go onto your computer, body counts. And it's scaring people, it's scaring people all over the place. No wonder people are getting worried. I don't, nor does anyone, have the answers of the outcomes of this this virus and what's going to happen. Perhaps this message will do one thing and one thing only, provoke us to think. God gave us these beautiful brains, ladies and gentlemen. And Jesus told us, don't worry about your life. What if we could just think? Maybe that will cause us to start to walk away from worry. Maybe that will help us to start to climb out of the pit of worry. Because worry will not change the outcome. But worry 
will wear you out. Nothing in our life justifies worry. We're to be content. And that's what Paul told us in Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned whatever state I am to be content. Contentment is such a great thing. Worry is the opposite of contentment. If I'm a believer, worry should be my normal, shouldn't it? It's like taking your temperature, 98.6. Okay? If I'm sick, my temperature goes up. Paul's a great example of contentment. You just got to think of Paul. Paul traveled from city to city. Oh, he's spreading the gospel. He'd go in. He'd speak someplace. People would like him at first. And then a group would come in, and they would hate him. They would rail on him. They would stone him. They'd run him out of town. He'd go to the next town, and the same thing would happen. Sometimes he was stoned, but he was so content. Paul's contentment was because he believed that he was God's and God's alone. God owned Paul. So the cares of this world were just that, the cares of this world. Paul's citizenship was in heaven because his faith was focused on heaven. The cares of the world belong to the world. You know, if you only have a little faith, if you have the faith of a, seed, of a mustard seed, you can have contentment. Because if you really have that faith, you have faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't have faith, though, then you own the cares of this world. That's something you don't want to have. I don't want to own the cares of this world. Seems like a hard line of demarcation, doesn't it? I have a question for you. Which side of the line do you want to be on? Do you want to be consumed by worry of everything in the world, or do you want to have contentment? Because we're still in this world. We do have a shelter in a time of storm. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, this is a great verse, folks. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, isn't that what we want to be? Don't we want Jesus to be carrying our burden for us? Let's ask ourselves, how do we deal with burdens? Because how we deal with these burdens in our lives is really important. In our churches today, I believe there's more fear, more discouragement, and more worry than we care to admit. I think it's a dirty little secret in our churches. This material world that we live in, the material world was not created as a spiritual refuge for us. It's not. We live in this world, but it's not a spiritual refuge for us. When we run to the world, asking the world, the world being a person, a place, or a thing, to do something for us that it cannot in a time of trouble, this creates more trouble. It really does. We need to remember that God is in the middle of our trouble already. Isn't that a better place to be? Knowing God is right there. God knows what's happening. You know, it's not... It's not that we're not going to have to deal with trouble. It's not that we're not have to deal with the situation. It's about how we deal with it is what Jesus is concerned about. Jesus wanted us to deal with this, every situation, including this one, without worry. We do need things in this world. The fruits of the Spirit is within us. If the fruit of the Spirit was in, are within us, how can there be room for worry, because we're of great value. In verse 26, it says, Look at the birds of the air, for, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than lay, they? Isn't that a great statement? We really are more valuable. And God is always calling us to acts of faith. God is calling us to commitment. What does God say? God says, seek me, obey me, follow me. God says, trust me. God is looking to change us. Not just our situation. God wants us. You know, we can make God the deliverer of good things. Make him our friend, our buddy. People say, oh, the guy upstairs. Is that what God really is in our thoughts? 
How about this? Is God something that leaves you breathless and excited? Have we come to the place where we say in our lives, my life is worth it because I know God? The clutter, the noise, the information overload of this world, it's not our spiritual refuge. It interferes with our relationship with God. Relationships take work. Worry. Worry will wear you out. Jesus said, don't do it. What a great directive that we have. It's a choice. Please bring your burdens to Jesus. Lay them down. He already has the outcome in his hands. We just need to trust in him. Don't worry about your life. Jesus has it. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time, Lord. I'm thankful that you take on all of our burdens. Worry is not something we need to have in our, our life, Lord. If anyone's listening to this message, Father, I hope that they can take it to heart, step back, take that deep breath, and understand God is good all the time, and we just need to trust in you in everything. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.